So uh, this morning we have uh, Tim Fowler, who's the Tertiary Education Commissioner, uh, Commission Executive Director from the Government of New Zealand, from Wellington, New Zealand. Um, one of the things that's really interesting is, in fact, the connection between New Zealand and the South Africa and the United States to the success movement. Um, as many of you know, former Vice Chancellor uh, and Rector at uh, University of Pretoria, Cheryl DeLaray, was one of the people who really helped get this work moving for us a decade ago. And uh, uh, our loss has been, I think, New Zealand's gain. She has uh, moved from the University of Pretoria to the University of Canterbury in uh, New Zealand. And it's been very exciting in the last several years to see uh, New Zealanders at achieving the Dreams Annual Conference dream. And for us, I think it's really part of this global interest in student success. You know, there was a time when most people who went to universities were wealthy white men. And over time, that's expanded. And as that's expanded, it's been about how do you change institutions to serve everyone, not just this very small minority of people. And so we're starting to see, obviously, in the United States and South Africa, but also in New Zealand. And so I, I, it's just really wonderful to see this expansion uh, spread out around the world to provide more opportunity for people who've been denied opportunities in the past. I just learned something that's very exciting for, um, at least for Rip Raps and Ashley Johnson and I. So it turns out that, um, I, I, I don't know, I, I'm not uh, stealing thunder, but it turns out that uh, Tim's daughter is moving to Michigan. And in a month or two, she's going to be going to Saginaw State University where she will be on the swim team. So uh, it's very exciting to hear that. But uh, we'd love to just invite uh, Tim up to the stage. Thank you. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you very much for, for having me uh, here in South Africa. Uh, can I pass on my, my thanks uh, to the Sipu Malala uh, organisation, uh, especially Alan and the team. I specifically said to Alan that I would uh, not go on about the 1995 World Cup and the fact that the All Blacks were poisoned, but uh, we'll move on from that. We have got over it. Apparently not. Um, can I also thank Bill and the team at the Christie Foundation for their financial support uh, to get me here. Um, I'm very pleased to be here to share our experience uh, with you on the critical issue of student uh, success. Our story, uh, our New Zealand story, which I'm going to share with you, uh, is unique to us, um, but take from it what you will. Um, uh, in sharing the story, uh, I'm specifically going to take a system level lens on the issue of learning success and how we can optimise and incentivise education systems to achieve it. It's a lens that pulls together education providers, government agencies, funding sources, policy contexts, political environments, educational best practice, relationship management, planning, some luck, lots of rat cunning, uh, and of course a lot of hard work. It is not a symphony of excellence in New Zealand yet by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but we are making some pretty good progress and I'm really pleased to be able to share that with you today. Uh, our journey started in 2016 when I was fortunate enough to make a trip to Georgia State University and visit with uh, the legend that is uh, Professor Tim Rennick. Uh, the GSU story is probably well documented and well known in South Africa, so I don't intend to traverse it here today. Uh, the point, though, is that it inspired us because here was an example of an, uh, a large um, university that had actually done it. It had actually achieved uh, equity of educational outcomes. And in uh, Georgia State's case, they had moved educational outcomes for black and Hispanics by more than 25% to achieve equity, which is pretty darn amazing. Um, and as a quick aside, when I talk about uh, achieving educational uh, outcomes and equity, um, what I'm talking about there is specifically and only in the New Zealand context we think about that being uh, qualification completions. Not uh, course completions, not uh, employment outcomes, 
but focusing on that output measure um, of qualification and completions, because really it is, while it's, it's simple and a little blunt, um, it is really what students go to university to do. They go to university to get a qualification, um, and that seems to us to be a nice simple way of focusing everyone's effort. So anyway, back on GSU, this, um, our, our experience there really focused, um, focused our attention and generated considerable discussion within New Zealand. Uh, but a key issue for us uh, was that, that we needed to contextualise the Georgia state and achieving the dream framework to New Zealand. And I think this is highlighted an issue that I suspect is quite relevant here, that being that we didn't want to recolonise New Zealand with an American approach. Um, the approach needed to reflect us, it needed to reflect our culture and our people. So however you go about this work, make sure it is contextualised to your setting. Uh, but equally, act collectively, uh, or better yet, as a system, if you truly want to move the dial on student success. And a defining system, uh, I ideally mean every university in South Africa, working alongside your government agencies, um, you know, whether it's the um, Higher Education Council or whether it's the Department of um, Higher Ed and, uh, and Training, everyone working together as a system. Sometimes that's not possible, and so working maybe collectively as a region or collectively as a city, um, and given the often disparate uh, array of faculties that go to making, go up to making a single uh, large university, um, then you know, working, pulling together all of those faculties just to work as one organisation can sometimes be a challenge in itself. So how you want to think about system is entirely over to you. When we think about system, we're thinking about all of New Zealand's universities, all of New Zealand's polytechnics, all of New Zealand's private training providers and the government working together. So there are many learnings and, um, from our experience and I'm really looking forward to um, sharing them with you and I'm very happy to take some questions in the, uh, at the end. In the, in, uh, in the interim though, let me uh, explain some of the context for you uh, about some of this work. So who are we? Uh, the Tertiary Education Commission, which I have the pleasure of leading, uh, is New Zealand's, the New Zealand government's investor in tertiary education. By that we mean vocational education, inclusive of apprenticeships, as well as higher education and research. And just for good measure, because we don't have much to do, uh, we also are New Zealand's careers information and advice agency. So we're an operational agency, we're not a regulator, we're not a policy agency. Our job is to help universities and the system get the job done. We have a board of commissioners appointed by the Minister of Education, and we've got a, a budget of four billion New Zealand dollars to spend on that education system. Our vision, as you can see here, is to ensure that all New Zealanders are equipped with the knowledge and skills they need for lifelong success. So we're a small operational agency of around 400 staff, and our key function is to give effect to the government's tertiary education strategy. Now that strategy explicitly refers to equity of educational outcomes for all students, uh, being a goal of the entire system's work. Now I think that's important to mention because um, the TESS, as we call it, the tertiary education strategy, um, Having that goal within the test means that no institution gets to opt out and say it's not a priority for us because it's a priority for the government and therefore it needs to be delivered upon. Um, so you'll hear me talk a little bit about what I call top cover. Um, top cover is this notion that our minister and the government and government ministers generally know about and support the things that we do. And so having top cover for the work that we do is particularly important. Uh, especially when we're having those gritty, hard conversations with my wonderful friends and colleagues who are the Vice-Chancellors of the University System. Um, so, the shape of the system, what do we look like in New Zealand? It's a lot different to here, I can tell you. Um, we've got nearly 800 tertiary education organisations. We call those TEOs, so if I drop into acronyms, you'll know what a TEO is. Um, on, within that we have eight universities, the largest of which is University of Auckland, and I think in the latest QS rankings they are, are around about 80 odd, I think, from memory. We've got around half a million learners 
Um, but that does include everything post-secondary. So it includes a good 200 odd thousand people who are doing apprenticeships uh, in vocational learning, as well as another couple hundred uh, in the university system. The structure of the system is actually quite uh, constant, uh, notwithstanding the usual fluctuations from time to time. But the number of learners, the number of providers is generally uh, pretty stable over the last decade. Just a quick step there, you'll see there's the pie graph down at the bottom there on the right hand side. Just a quick note on the stats for Māori and Pacifica students uh, in our system. While their petition rate, uh, participation rate is actually very good, uh, in that they participate at a rate proportionate to the populations, to their population size, this masks unfortunately a very disproportionate uh, level of study where they study at a much lower level on the qualification framework than what we would want. So I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, equally, New Zealand is not exempt from many of the global challenges in tertiary education. Uh, financial sustainability is a particular one. Um, and in fact, I, I did make a comment to a couple of the, um, the people I spoke with yesterday that I was very glad to be here this week because uh, three of our universities are currently going through some major restructuring. Uh, and in fact, my alma mater, Victoria University, is in the process of making probably about 10% of its staff redundant um, off the back of you know, posting 30 to $40 million uh, operating loss. So those sorts of you know, financial um, issues are important in our system. And having just been in Europe for a couple of weeks, I can tell you uh, that is very much the case in the likes of the UK um, as well. Interestingly, for our universities, uh, this potentially, this, this financial strain actually potentially gives them a real financial incentive to achieve equity of outcomes. Uh, and for us, and TEC, it allows us to focus on developing what we would call an ROI or a return on investment approach to supporting universities achieve those outcomes. So in short, equity uh, for us is a moral imperative, but it's equally really good for business. And getting that balance between the two, uh, and getting both of those ideas in the heads, especially of the vice chancellors and the chancellors and councils of our universities, has been a real focus of our effort. I did want to br briefly mention to Pukinga. If you look down the bottom left-hand side of that slide, there's the uh, the word to Pukinga, Maori word, um, and uh, to Pukinga is the single entity formed in 2020. Um, that brings together most vocational education and apprenticeships. It also teaches degree level study, and in fact, pretty much 80% of our nursing students uh, doing degrees are, are taught at, at Pukinga. It is the result of a large reform process over the last four years that saw 26 organisations merged into one. That is a story in its own right. If you want to ask me about that, I've got a great deal to prove it. Um, needless to say, um, it is large with 250,000 learners, and so achieving the outcome and the equity of outcomes there is actually a really important focus for us because clearly it would move the dial on the whole system if we were to achieve um, equity uh, of outcomes at Pukia. So um, I really enjoyed um, Murray's presentation yesterday, and as a uh, as a person who um, loves the numbers, the numbers tell a story and they mostly don't lie. Um, this is a good example. Uh, this very, very clearly def um, sort of gives you a sense of what our problem is that we're trying to solve. The system just simply does not deliver good outcomes for everybody. Uh, at degree level, the qualification completion rate for Māori uh, and for non-Māori, non-Pacifica, sorry, the gap between the um, qualification completion rate for Māori and non Māori, non Pacifica was 13% uh, in 2012, um, but that has really blown out uh, to around 18% in 2021. Similar story for Pacifica students uh, for degree completions. Um, look, 44.4% in 2022 compared to 38.4% uh, in 2020 and 2012. So, we have um, what could really be only described as both an, uh, an economic as well as moral imperative there. Um, the changing demographics in our country mean that New Zealand will rely upon Māori and Pacifica graduates to meet an increasing proportion of our national future skill needs. So by 2043, not actually that far away, 33% uh, of our population uh, will be Māori and Pacifica. 
Um, they're also projected to make up about 20, sorry, Maori are projected to make up about 21% of that population, but it's an extremely young population. 42% uh, of that population is aged between 15 and, 16, 15 and 64. So um, we've got a real challenge on that front, exactly the same with Pacifica. So clearly we need a, uh, a system that is fit for purpose. And this is just another illustration uh, that it's not. So again, the numbers um, randomly here, just picked three out from the team before I left. 341, 341 is the number of individual interventions at our eight universities in the last decade that have been implemented to try and shift the dial on learner success. None of which worked. So just 341. Uh, a large number, and I think this is a good example for me of uh, where collective action needs to be taken as opposed to well-meaning individuals doing things at the grassroots level. Um, so I think that the universities thought that they they probably spent about 10 to 15 million dollars on implementing those as well. So um, 341 is a big number in, in my mind that demonstrates the need for change. Uh, 22.5, that is the qualification completion gap. Uh, who's that for? That is for all universities um, for the gap for qualification completions for Pacifica students. So, uh, and then the last one, 28.2. Um, I don't like calling out individuals, but I'm going to do, do it um, from the safety of South Africa. <laughs> um, this is um, the 28.2 percent is the qualification completion rate for Pacifica students studying at one of our universities. So, if you can think about that from my perspective as the funder, I'm putting in four billion dollars of taxpayer money every year. This university comes to me and says, "Look, I've got way more students than uh, I've got way more demand, and especially for Pacifica students." And I turn around and say, well, look, here's the problem. Only three out of 10 actually get a qualification when they come to you. So, and the university, especially the vice chancellors, don't like hearing that conversation, of course, because they're very interested in the dough. Um, but that creates a real, it, it creates a real tension in the relationship with, with us. Um, but I think the numbers are a good, and we've used, them, used the numbers uh, a great deal when we're having the individual conversations with them. Uh, but I think another good example of why we needed to change. So, in our view, we desperately needed to do something different and again, take that whole of system approach. We needed to, needed the transformation change to achieve a system level shift. So over the last three years, we've developed a national learner success framework that we judge every institution on. Not just universities, not just the large institutions, everybody. Um, that uh, learner success framework is based on international evidence. Uh, obviously, we've uh, leaned heavily upon our friends at uh, Achieving the Dream, as well as utilising local best practice. We've tested that framework. Uh, with partners in the university, polytechnics and private providing system and we're now implementing that at scale. Um, I think the key, the key for us though in, in doing that um, and bringing all this work together was um, being real about the fact that it's, our, it's, it's us, it's our institutions that are actually the problem here, not the student. And I'll talk a little bit about this later, especially with some of the naysayers, the, those who are slow to adopt the sorts of things that we're trying to do here. Um, they tend to reflect back that it's the students' fault, they're not good enough prepared. Um, you know, the schooling system was doing a better job, it would be fine. But the institutions that have managed to go, you know something? It's us. They're the ones who have made the huge gains the quickest. So, um, how are we seeking to move uh, the dial? Well, the key here is to recognise that our job, TC, is to create the framework and I'm going to talk a little bit more about incentives uh, and support for universities that we've provided so that they can do the work themselves. Uh, you can see that there are several key elements here, but the main things um, I just wanted to point out, of course, is that it needs to be a holistic all of organisation approach. If I say all of organisation one more time, you'll probably go, man, 
Um, but it's, I don't think it's probably anything more important than that uh, holistic rule of organisation bit of the work. I did want to call out leadership, and I also is a critical component to what we have tried to approach with this. So the first one is, um, can the institution demonstrate that the council in the first instance, um, which is the governing body of the organisation and the chancellor, um, are they holding the, the, the university's management team, the vice chancellor, principal, the provost, um, to account? Are they asking for regular quarterly uh, updates on how progress is going with that organisational approach? Can we see that it's the, the teaching and learning is involved as well as all the usual stuff that you want to see around data analytics, around pastoral support, around student services? Are all of those things there? And are they taking a, um, a realistic approach to governing that work? One of the things that we, uh, we like to talk about with our institution is not marking your own homework. So we like to say, you know, bringing somebody independent to be on your government script to actually provide some independent um, oversight over the work you're doing so you're not telling yourself stories about how good you are. Um, and I think if you reflect upon your own, um, your own personal circumstances, I think we're all pretty good at telling ourselves we're pretty good at stuff, eh? Um, but having somebody provide that external uh, lens is really important. Um, I also did want to make a quick comment on, um, oh, sorry, one of the things we therefore think is that you know, our role, my role in particular, um, is there has been a support to the people who are on the ground doing the, what we call the mahi, the work, doing the work on the ground, the practitioners on the ground doing the work, uh, and our role is to be there to support them by ensuring that their bosses, the vice-chancellor, and the boss of the vice-chancellor, the chancellor, actually prioritise the work, invest in the work, and are required to take an all of, all of, all of organisational um, approach. I won't comment on the data and analytics side because I just think over the last 24 hours we've seen um, so much uh, best practice there that I don't think I'll be adding, adding anything uh, to the conversation. But I did want to talk um, specifically about uh, and call out this role of transforming the academic component uh, of student success. So our work has encouraged universities to analyse their individual course attrition and performance data. Um, that has shown that in many universities there are generally 10 to 20, sometimes a little more, individual courses, such as Psychology 1 or Macroeconomics 1, uh, that are critical to student success or failure in the university. So critical to student success or failure, depending upon how things work. So for instance, uh, at one university they demonstrated that for students studying accounting one, that if they got a C, they were only 50% likely to complete the entire qualification. But if they got a B, or better, they were 90% likely to complete the qualification. Um, so this provided the catalyst for rethinking the overall delivery of that individual program. Um, so that more students, or as many students as we possibly could manage within an institution, manage to get that B or better. Now it's not about decreasing the quality, it's not about decreasing the benchmarks required to pass with a B, it's about rethinking the delivery method such that everyone gets it and is able to excel. Now, the American school does catapult courses, um, but they are very much an area of our focus and uh, the institutions that we've seen move the quickest have been the ones that have embraced um, thinking about their course attrition data and acting quickly on um, catapult courses. And, and it's a fascinating thing to actually see uh, at work. Um, so our key tool in this process is what we call learner success plans. Uh, if you are an institution in New Zealand and you get more than $5 million of government money, you are required to complete a learner success plan. Uh, the plan has to detail how the organisation is going to achieve uh, equity of educational outcomes for their learners, and it must include, most importantly, the intervention logic and roadmap as to how they intend to achieve those outcomes. Uh, it must include lead and lag indicators of success, 
And I think this is important because it requires a really strong connection between the vision at the high level. It's very easy to say we're going to achieve equity by 2030. And by the way, here are a bunch of things that we're doing. And the problem that we have seen very, very quickly is that there's actually uh, a big gap, daylight, crickets, nothing happening between the vision and the actions. That's right. So the intervention logic um, is massively important. And I think that's, that goes back to that issue of you know, how are you governing this activity because um, the governance of this activity should be asking, show me the intervention logic. Show me how you intend to actually demonstrate that those actions are going to move the dial. And if they are moving the dial, how do you scale them up? If they're not moving the dial, do you go quick fail, move on to the next thing? Because I think one of the things that we all know from our experience in this space is that there's never enough money and there's never enough time to do everything that we want. So one of the things that we've encouraged these institutions to do is be a little hard on themselves around the things that aren't working and not... Um, it's the New Zealand uh, persona, I should tell you, that uh, we... Uh, and it's a great comparison to make with the Australians, which is that, uh, yes, you know, the Australians quite... Um, what do we say? Arrogant, um, and they're quite, they're, quite, uh, they're quite confident in their own abilities, aren't they? So one of the things that we say is that if there were 10 opportunities on the table, the Australians will go and take all of them, they'll fail with five, they'll, they'll succeed with five, and they'll celebrate like they've achieved 100. <laughs> right? The New Zealanders, however, we see 10, 10 opportunities on the table, we procrastinate for a long time, we, um, we, we do that for so long, we miss the opportunity to do, actually do eight. Um, we do two, we fail with one, we succeed brilliantly with, with, the, the, uh, with one of them, but then we flog ourselves and flagellate ourselves for a cheap or failing on the one. Um, that's sort of the difference between the two countries in a nutshell. <laughs> But the point here is we've got to get out of that habit and actually say, you know something, trying stuff and failing is actually just part of this mix. And uh, making it a safe space to better do that, I think is quite important. Um, our experience to date is that the universities or our providers generally who have jumped on the bandwagon of this approach um, of, the, of the, uh, the framework and then with the Furnace Success Plans, um, if they've jumped on the bandwagon early, they tend to be doing a lot better. Um, we're focused on the nine or ten institutions with the largest number of um, qualification completions uh, in the system because we know that if we, they account for 75% of the overall students. If we can get them succeeding, we're going to get uh, the dial moving very, very quickly. Um, one thing I did want to um, talk a little bit about was this notion of coalition building. Um, and I think it's a pretty important part of the job. In um, Te Reo, which is the Māori language, uh, which I uh, gave you a little, of in, little, a little of in my introduction, um, <coughs> there's a wonderful proverb that says, uh, tui tui tangata, tui tui kurawai. Um, and that means that um, it takes bringing together a number of people to weave a fine cloak. Uh, and I think this is quite a good little metaphor for the sort of work um, that, we, that, we, that you are doing, but also that we're trying to do in New Zealand. It takes a lot of people to actually do this work really, really well. Um, it hasn't always been simple with our university friends in particular, uh, and different institutions and individuals within, within those institutions are all at different stages. So this slide is one which we have produced because we take a um, quite a deliberate relationship management approach the way in which we work with the institutions. So we've developed these personas. Uh, as you can see here, denier, passionate resistor, reassurance seeker and trailblazer um, to, to name and put a, uh, put a face on the different types of people that we're working with within the institutions. And then what we try and do is um, move them towards from the left to the right, right? Um, but you can see, so there's some great stuff in here, of course. Um, the deniers, the passionate resistors with, with comments like, it's all the school's fault. Uh, it would just be easier if the government gave us more money. Um, uh, I think one of the, the obvious ones is, especially we get from some Māori and Pacifica academic staff, um, is they, um, 
The solutions need to be homegrown. Like we have a mortgage on good ideas, let me tell you something for real, we don't. So my view is we should be you know, accessing uh, the best ideas we can possibly have from around the world. Um, trailblazer, well look, there's one trailblazer in New Zealand and that is Cheryl Delaray. So you should be extremely proud that a South African has come to New Zealand. Um, yeah. I mean, and ironically, she's gone to possibly the most conservative dare I say, white uh, institution in New Zealand um, and has transformed it. Uh, so it's a, it's a really interesting um, case. I'll talk a little bit more about how we've approached and try to support the work that um, she has done there. And I should, when I say she, I, I mean, she's the vice chancellor, she's got a wonderful team around her who she has encouraged and they have really picked up and especially with the, uh, the ATD folks has done some, have done some wonderful work. So words like outliers, curious, brave, wanting to take risks and see opportunities prepared to challenge. Uh, trailblazers are massively important and um, my view is that our job is to support them the most. And I'll come back to a little bit about why um, in a minute. So, Especially on the left-hand side, the passionate resistors and deniers, um, we faced that sort of common refrain for quite some time. Uh, when faced with these types of people and situations, we clearly needed a mix of approaches, incentives, and occasionally some sticks, and I thought I should talk about some of those now. Um, so the levers clearly matter. To encourage um, our providers, and particularly our universities, to take action, we're focused on the two things that the universities hold most dear. Does anyone want to hazard a guess as to what they are? <laughs> Who wants to, to, to shout out some, some, what do you think the two things are the universities hold most dear? This is my humble opinion, of course, so this is probably very different to South Africa. Anyone have a, has a go? Funding. Pardon? Funding. Funding? Yeah. Money? Money is definitely one. What's the other one? <laughs> Nice and loud. Academic freedom. Academic freedom. No, that's well, that's clearly in the mix. But I'm going to I'm going to put down number three. Anyone on anyone else? Button? Throughput. Not quite. Well, let me tell you what I think. This is what I think it is. Oh, well, I'll come back to that because I think that, that to me goes to exactly what the next one is, which is reputation. Reputation drives driven by research, partly driven by the money, and throughput drives your reputation as well, right? So reputation and money. So if you can just imagine me sitting in my office with my, with my colleagues trying to think about how can we try and move these universities? Um, money and reputation. So look, an overall comment, um, we have said to the universities and their leaders that if they want to grow, and therefore will find them more money, they need government funding to grow, but we're not going to do that unless they have demonstrated that they've got a learner success plan that ticks all, that meets all the requirements that, um, that we've got and that they're actually making progress. So it's not a compliance exercise because it's not a tick box. If it's a plan, we just tick the boxes and we've, take, we've made TC happy, well, that's not going to get us anywhere. So we want to see action. We've equally said that if they can't demonstrate that, then it's highly likely we'll take money off them. Well, that's sort of got their attention, as you can possibly imagine. Um, so I've got a, we've got a, a several levers here, which I, I'm not going to mention all of them, but I thought uh, mentioning a couple might be of interest to you. So investment plan length. Um, all of our universities have investment plans. Uh, those plans uh, uh, vary in length from one to three years. All of the universities are traditionally on three-year plans because they're well-run, sophisticated organisations that generally do a very good job at, at, at um, teaching and research. Um, however, investment plans now include our assessment of their learner success plan as well. So in the last year, we've actually put um, Massey University on a one-year plan and what do they think about that? Ooh. Reputation. Reputational risk, they were mortified. 
and they went out of their way to ensure that no other university knew about it. <laughs> but behind the scenes, behind the curtain, they were doing everything they possibly could to actually get their act together on their success. So they came back this year and um, their learner success plan has gone from being rubbish to being probably one of the best alongside University of Canterbury uh, and Professor De La Rey's um, university. So, um, yeah, just a bit of an example of nudges. Nudges matter. Um, and whether it's reputation or money, um, they both work. Um, equally, uh, additional funding requests is another. Uh, we have Often, given the, the excess of demand over supply in South Africa, I think this is one that probably resonates with you. Uh, we often have universities coming back to us during the year to say, look, you funded me for $200 million, uh, but I've got excess demand, I want to enrol more students. Um, and traditionally we've said, yes, that's absolutely fine. Um, you know, we'll give you an extra 10, 15 million to, to do that. Um, we've now attached that to learner success as well. So if they come back to us and we're not happy, with their learner success plan or the progress they're making on its implementation, um, we would say, no, nah, you can. Uh, and of course, that, that impacts their bottom line, uh, leads to deficits if they're not operating really efficiently. So we're trying to really nudge and encourage them in a whole variety of different ways um, to into the right sort of uh, space. Now, it's not all. Uh, it's not all sticks. There is the. Uh, I thought I should say yes. There are some carrots. Um, and I think it's important that as a government at some point um, we do actually front up with more money to support the work that the universities do in this space because as, as I said, for the most part they do an absolutely stunning job and we want to be able to support it. Um, so you'll, uh, I think you'll uh, be familiar with some of the things that we've done because it very much replicates uh, the likes of the work that has gone on. Uh, that the um, Kresge Foundation has actually supported here. So we've done uh, a fair bit of um, UX funding, so uh, we pay for universities and other providers to test out various approaches to learner success. And um, this has really helped refine the framework and uh, improve its suitability for New Zealand. Um, a requirement of that funding, of course, is that all institutions must share their, uh, their findings with the sector. Now, I've got to tell you that I was just stunned at the level of uh, detail and honesty um, yesterday in the sessions that I went to around reflecting back on, you know, reporting back on how things are working here. And I was just, I was just thoroughly impressed by that. Um, and if I transform myself into a room with a bunch of New Zealand universities, it's, um, I don't think we're quite there yet. Uh, sharing and not just the successes, but sharing the, as one of my bosses used to call them, the not so successes. Um, you know, there's a, there's a really important part of the learning for everybody. And in fact, I would probably argue that learning, you know, sharing the, sharing those failures is actually probably more important because it's a real good lesson for us. So uh, I guess I was just stunned by the, uh, by that level of honesty uh, yesterday. So, so well done to you as a system. Um, one thing I did want to mention is uh, an accelerated learner success fund. Uh, one of the other good reasons for me to be out of the country this week is that our, uh, our, um, our government, uh, the cabinet committee, has just approved a fund uh, that will allow us to spend up to $10 million uh, per year on co-investing in learner success projects. So this is the idea of um, something that might be being done already, so let's say it's a catapult course, uh, that an institution wants to redevelop maybe five of them, we would co-invest in that. If it's costing five mil, we'd put in, we'd put in maybe two and a half, and that would allow them to maybe do ten of those courses in a year rather than five, and accelerate uh, the work that's been done. So we're really thrilled that that's been, uh, been approved. So look, the key, I think, to our approach is not just the what we do, but it's the how we do it. Um, and we've therefore placed a very high emphasis upon partnerships. Um, we want to be seen as a partner uh, rather than just a funder. Um, now, where our job is to support the success, uh, uh, the, the institution's success and their student's success. Um, and then I've got to say it's a bit of a mind sh mindset shift for uh, both ourselves as well as the institutions. Um, 
the, our universities are very um, independent, autonomous organisations uh, whose view about government in this space is they'd rather just us send more. Uh, our support for the New Zealand delegation um, going to achieving the dream in 2018, 2023. Um, and of course we bring our own sector together the same way you have done uh, today uh, for Learner Success Conferences and the like. Uh, and apart from all of that, I think the, the most important, one of the most important things we've done there is actually develop a, a free toolkit uh, that all institutions can use to take them uh, on their journey. So in, uh, in summary, what, have we, um, what are the lessons that we've learned and what are the challenges that we see uh, going forward? Well, the first one, of course, is that even small amounts of money targeted well, both money in as well as money out, can actually make a really big difference uh, and help universities, uh, in our case, on their learner success journey. Uh, second, the fundamental importance of leadership. Um, if, if somebody asked, if we just kept coming back to it, if, if you had to really um, press me on what is, the, what is the single greatest factor that drives this? Leadership to me is the most important thing. Now, the point, the point the thing there to say is that leadership is not just something that vice chancellors do. Leadership is not just something that vice chancellors do. It's something that we all do. We've all got the opportunity to be a leader. Um, and every day, I'm certain that the people in this room are doing, uh, you know, taking a leadership position on something, putting their, sticking their head out and saying, hey, no, listen, I think this is the way to do it, or no, this is the way to do it. The third one, um, which I did want to mention, which I mentioned earlier, is this issue of political top cover. Um, our ministers, we had three ministers, three senior ministers, in fact, one of them is now, actually now the Prime Minister, uh, attend our Learner Success Conference in 2019. Um, having a minister know about the work and be supportive of it, um, gives us the ability to really push the boat out really hard on things that would otherwise be quite difficult to do. Now, the third one on the left there is, of course, FOMO, which I'm presuming everybody knows. Um, so this is uh, a really interesting one. We've relied a lot on the, the notion of um, the fear of missing out. Now, we've got, what we've done is gotten behind and supported the institutions who are performing really well, rather than spending money and time and effort on the laggards. Why? Go back to the two things that the universities are most interested in, money and reputation. So if I support um, the likes of the University of Canterbury, which we're doing a lot of at the moment, they get a march on, things start looking really good, they start achieving results, which they are. They've got a very much, they're the only university in New Zealand that's actually increasing their enrolments at the moment. Why? Because their learner success is just really, really good. What happens then? Well, every other university wants to be exactly like them. They want to know, how did they do that? So the fear of missing out, FOMO, is something that, uh, you know, it's the whole behavioural economics thing. Uh, the psychology of what we do is just as important as the actual substance. So, uh, where we put our effort and where you put your effort um, is really particularly important on that front. Um, look, this is a journey, uh, it's a transformation exercise and I, I've got to say, uh, in management speak, I often get um, um, told off for being Taylorist uh, and managerial and all those sorts of things. Um, so the, this notion we get a lot of in, in management speak of quick, quick wins, and there's no quick wins in this space. My sense is it's all just hard work and a long-term effort to try and move, move the dial. Um, so be prepared to stay of course um, and commit for the long term, which is another reason why that leadership is vital. The last one I did want to mention on the lesson side was this, this focus on ROI. Um, you know, it, the return won't happen overnight, but it will happen. Um, and an example of this is that we partnered recently with our university colleagues um, and they did some research that demonstrated that the combined uh, attrition from summer melt, which is this number of students who apply to a university um, at the beginning of summer, our enrolment is in uh, autumn, so they apply to the university in, in summer, um, but a very, very large number of them never convert into an enrolment. 
And then if you, can, you combine that with the number who uh, do not complete first year, well, those two combined numbers come to about $900 million of lost revenue in one year. So again, back to the two things that matter, um, $900 million goes a long, I think you'll agree, goes a long, long way in supporting the sorts of things that we would do. So being good at it um, got everybody's attention. Finally, uh, the challenges. Um, look, there are still, ch still questions, still challenges for us uh, in our work as a system leader. Um, now, how, how we do what we do to support universities over the short term uh, to help them reorganise uh, and change their business as usual to being a business as usual that supports uh, learner success is a really tricky one. And I don't think we've actually figured that one out yet. The last one I did want to mention before I wind up is just to say competition and collaboration. Um, I, I framed it there as binary, but in actual fact, I think it's, it's a, uh, it's, the two can sit comfortably alongside each other. Um, I mean, there appears to be um, an area where collaboration between, this appears at least to be an area where collaboration between universities would be really valuable, but in New Zealand the default setting is one of competition. Um, so it's, that's extremely difficult to unwind uh, and negate. Um, all in all, um, you know, we're a work in progress, um, but we can see sufficient progress with the actual results uh, of students to be confident that we're heading in the right direction. Uh, I'm really heartened by the progress to make to date, uh, but actually also seized with the importance that uh, this is a really important job to get right. My observation over the last couple of days is that we've got definitely as much to learn from, from you, our South African colleagues, as um, you've got to learn from us. Um, can I say I've been um, thrilled to be here and um, really wish you all well in the endeavour that you've uh, undertaken. Uh, it's God's work, it's important. And um, let's all get behind learner success both in New Zealand uh, and in South Africa. Can I say uh, to wind up, no reda tin na kota tin na kota tin na kota kota. Cheers. Well, thank you so much, Tim. I think this is a great food for thought. I think it's fascinating to see sort of the different approaches. I, I can't even gosh, imagine, I can't even imagine if uh, say the state of Michigan or the US Department of Education was you know, expecting and required institutions to perform these things, but we can all hope and pray that someday we can do this good. Thank you so much, Tim.